And now a new investigation by Chief Inspector Maygray, who finds himself asking just how far decent people will go to preserve their reputation. Georges Simenon's Maigret, Inspector Cadaver. Dramatised by David Cregan. Starring Nicolas Le Prevot as Chief Inspector Maigret, with Julian Barnes as Georges Simenon. It was a dream world from the start. The wet night canals of the Vendée glittering in the darkness and the tiny branch line to Saint-Aubin. Good heavens. Cover! Just un cover! You used to work with me at the Quai des Orfèvres, remember? Carver! Oh, sorry to be late meeting you. It is Chief Inspector. No, it's not. Uh, oh, uh... Monsieur, no! Uh, I think it's me you've come for. Oh, oh, I'm so sorry, Chief Inspector. I should have recognised you from the papers. I'm Etienne No, oh. brother-in-law of your examining magistrate, Monsieur Brejean. Let me take your bags. Good evening, Pierre. Monsieur. The station master. Charming fellow. Come this way, and not the public exit. The road's impassable for cars in this weather, so I've brought the pony and trap. Is there a hotel in the Santo Bar? Good heavens. You're not staying in a hotel. Your room's ready at home. And we've held dinner back so you can join us. I, I'd like to know if the man who got off the train I, with I me. I don't oh. know who he was. I'd like to know if you'll manage to find somewhere to stay. Jump up, and off we go. It isn't far. Do you think you'll find somewhere to stay? Well, probably. You know, I don't know what my brother-in-law's been telling you about these parts. Now that he's living in Paris, he probably looks on Saint-Aubin as the end of the world, but I have to tell you, things are changing. There are two excellent inns here. The Lyon d'Or, run by Madame Taponnier, Old Francine, as everyone calls her. And just opposite is the Hotel des Trois Mules. Justin Carvre, the other man, drifted away somewhere in the mist, and, and, and my host he ran on and on, Simonon, never mentioning the reason why I was there. You knew this Carvre. I, he was fired from the force, set up as a private detective. He'd always hated me. No, he was somewhere here, you know, in this foggy countryside, pretending not to know me. I, I felt rather alone. So, here we are, our humble dwelling. Let me help you down. Humble? It's a blaze of light. Well... <laughs> At the time it was built, no one foresaw that a railway was going to pass under the windows. But you, you get used to it, of course, and there are very few trains. Uh, take the pony to the stable, will you? Yes. Come on. So, do come in. And uh, give me your coat. I'm appalled my brother-in-law asked you to come all this way in weather like this. The house was suffocating. It was large and comfy with log fires and grand oak staircase, but it was so still. It was as if every chair and table had stood where it was for centuries. It felt padded. The world outside couldn't penetrate. I found it hard even to think. This is Chief Inspector Megre, my wife Louise. Good evening, Chief Inspector. I'm appalled. My brother has asked you to come all this way and weather like this. I... Her brother? Monsieur Bréjean, my examining magistrate in Paris. You see, Maigret, my sister, Louise Bréjean, became Madame No when she married Etienne No, son of Sébastien No, related on his mother's side to some very good families in the Vendée. But they live, would you believe, beside a small branch railway line near the village of Saint-Aubin, where they do farm pretty splendidly. About three weeks ago, a local boy, Albert Etayot, 
quite a good family too on his mother's side, uh, she's a pillow, was found dead on the tracks. Clearly an accident, but rumours have started and even anonymous letters. And to put the whole thing in a nutshell, people are accusing my brother-in-law of having killed the boy, would you believe? In fact, it's going to be difficult to stop an official inquiry. Which is why, Chief Inspector, I've arranged for you to have a little unofficial holiday to reassure everyone. They're very decent people. Now, may I introduce you to a friend of the family, Albon Grucotel. I expect my brother-in-law mentioned him to you. How do you do, Chief Inspector? I'm a great admirer of yours. Ah. Uh, Albo is having dinner with us. They insist on laying a place at their table for an old recluse like me. Not very old, monsieur. <laughs> Perhaps not. Shall we go through? Oh. And what did they have to say about the boy's death? They didn't. The rumours said he was a lover of their daughter and spent two or three nights each week in her bedroom by means of a ladder. But no one was talking about it during that luxurious supper, though I did try. Your brother spoke warmly of your daughter, madame. Uh, Genevieve has been ill for several days and uh, stops in her room. Samon savoir en chantilly, Monsieur Maigret. Or Armagnac, before you go to bed. And a cigar, perhaps. Dreams came thick and fast in bed, first about hayfields and country life, things from childhood, and then there was a sour face of Justin Cavre, whom we always called Inspector Cadaver. Oh, he was bitter and furious and silent. And then there was something to do with bribes. He had an expensive wife. And now here he was, among the canals, pretending I didn't exist. You really were alone. Yeah, and uncomfortable. Especially when the door of my room... Who's there? I have to speak to you, Monsieur Maigret. Well, if you'll just look away for a minute... Uh... I am Genevieve No, and I am pregnant by Albert Retailleau. If my father finds out, I will kill myself and no one will stop me. Perhaps you're... Too young to decide. Do as you think best. I'm in your hands. Geneviève? Oh. Up already, monsieur? Uh, it's barely daylight. We farmers are always up early, of course, so. Oh, I, I, I thought I heard someone earlier. Dreams. <laughs> or Albon going to the lavatory, I expect. He stayed the night? He's a good fellow, Maigret. Do you know, he reads masses of books and remembers them all. Amazing. Pity his wife was so eccentric. Is Albon divorced? We don't do that round here, Chief Inspector. <laughs> she took off for Nice with the children and, uh, well, she doesn't live alone. Who has the money? Well, she's certainly a very rich woman. Uh, will you come with me to look round the estate? The, the man who got off the train with me, <coughs> does, does he live near here? I've never met him. I have. He's a private detective. Who do you think sent for him? We're all decent people here, Monsieur Maigret. You know, I can't help wondering if my brother-in-law made a mistake in sending for someone as famous as you to clear up a little rumour that will disappear in a week. It, it's affecting Genevieve, of course, but, but she'll soon recover. What does she uh, make of these stories? I don't know. We haven't talked about any of it. Not at all. Shall I take you into town later? I have business in Fontenay-le-Comte. I, I could drop you off. Um, I'd rather walk. My old colleague may be at the uh, Lyon d'Or, which you recommended. The early mist was clearing as I walked into the village. Smoke began to curl up from chimneys, and there were lights in the Lyon d'Or. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to sample a glass of the 
local brandy? Ain't none. Well, uh, cognac. I'm making coffee. Oh, for my, my friend who came in last night, I see his coat hanging up. You might get cognac at the place across the road. Go there if you want to drink this early. On the other side of the road, I saw a tall woman going up a little alley to a small but very comfortable house. She was in black, as if in mourning. Uh, is it Madame Retailleau, mother of Albert? Who are you? A chief inspector, Maigret, of the If police. you come from Monsieur No, he's already been to see me and I have nothing more to say. Please tell him. It's humiliating to talk about the way that morning went because I felt I wasn't myself. I wasn't anyone. I'd come to help the No family straighten out the rumours and neither they nor anyone else in the village seemed to want me to be there. I've never felt so ignored. And when I visited the mayor's office, Inspector Cadaver came out just as I went in. He had a large leather briefcase which he carried under his arm and clearly was ahead of me with, with, well, money, I imagine, or words of warning. He said nothing to me, and the mayor's secretary said very little more. As far as we're concerned, the case is closed. Albert was a very nice boy, his mother is well respected, lives on a pension from her husband's death. Nothing else to say. Time will heal the wounds, as the phrase goes. You could have left. You were only doing a favour. I wasn't going to let Carver get away with whatever it was. Pretending I wasn't there. Getting to people before I did. You were pig-headed. Yes. Something was wrong that had to be revealed. Ah, Monsieur Maigret. I nearly ran you over. Searching out the evidence, of which there is very little. Well, I... Do let's go into my house here. A scruffy bachelor's warren, I fear, and full of dusty books but also a glass of porto for the mid-morning break. <sighs> so you know the rumours. Mm. Mm. That the, uh, the boy was killed by Monsieur No. Ridiculous. Etienne is the sweetest man. Rather dull, but very rich. But the boy was clearly killed by a train. There was practically nothing left of him. Mm. There are stories that he was Genevieve's lover. Mm. I've heard those, though whether they're true. I'd say it's unlikely, since she's a sophisticated girl. Visits her uncle, the magistrate, in Paris, mm. that sort of thing. And Albert was very local. <laughs> Not that I have any ideas about any of it, as I was away at the time of the tragedy. Shall we meet at lunch? You've known the No family a long time? They've been very kind, especially since I've been alone. I did then go into the other inn in the village, Les Trois Mules. A group of men were sitting at a long table, one of whom was about the age Albert had been. They stopped talking the moment I went in. One of them spat in my direction. Gentlemen, uh, I'm here to help the cause of justice. Justice? For Etienne? No. <laughs> <laughs> Go back to the Leon door. They give you a sort of free drinks there. <laughs> For justice, I need to find one of Albert Retaillot's friends. No, a real friend. If possible, one who was with him on that last evening. That's me. Good. Well, perhaps we can... Now, why are you staying with the No family? They were told I was coming, and... They met me at the station. I didn't know any in. Who's the man in the Leon door working for? I don't know. Why is there still no proper inquiry? Albert died three weeks ago. He would never have walked in front of a train, even when he was drunk. And he loved life too much to top himself. As soon as I have enough evidence, an there inquiry There is will... evidence. Albert's cap. It was found in the reeds of the canal, close to the nose house, 500 metres from the body. If we could prove it was found there. Well, I was drinking with Albert that night, and I know a lot. Yes? I went part of the way towards the big house with him. He was very angry. With? With her. Genevieve, no. Had he told you before? He used to go there nearly every night. He was in love, and 
everyone could see was. Yet he was angry with her on that last day. Something was on his mind the whole evening. He, he just kept looking at his watch the whole time. And when eventually we parted company by the railway track, he squeezed my hand and said, tears in his eyes, he said, it's all over between us. Then he went off towards the house. I saw him in the moonlight, clear as anything, going round the back towards the stables. Wearing his cap. I have the cap. Bloodstained. If you're for justice, come with me. It's only me, Mother. Wait here. I'll be back in a minute, Monsieur. Uh, he's uh, helping me with some inquiries, Madame. Into the death of Albert Retailleau. No, oh, him. It's been stolen! It was here this morning, I know it was. Who's been here, Mother? Who's been here and taken away Albert's cap? Uh, don't bother to answer, Madame. I know who was here. The man from the Leon door? I think so. I've another idea. Old Desiree found the cap as he was collecting milk from the farms to take to the dairy. He does it in a barge, going round the canal, suits him fine. Trouble is, he drinks, like everyone here. And for that, he needs money. He wasn't at the dairy. He wasn't in any of the little drinking rooms where people seem to gather, almost in secret. But finally, he was thought to be at the post office. Has Desiree been in here this morning? Indeed he has. <laughs> Drunk as always. And getting me all muddled up with me letters like he does. His son is going to be very pleasantly surprised. Desiree sent a money order for 500 francs to him. Oh, hell, it's the man from the Leon door again. Desiree never usually had money. I, I, I know the cap was there. He told us all where he found it. And it had blood on it. It's them. It's always them twisting things their way. Let's have lunch together in Les Trois-Mules. You can't give up, you know. Of course not. Is there anything else people won't tell me? Well, yes. Joseph at the postman had a story he now says he hasn't. He visited Madame Retailleau about ten days after Albert's funeral. There was money owing on something. Madame Retailleau hadn't enough in her purse. She has a soup tureen on a dresser, big one with blue and white flowers on it. And she faced herself to it so Joseph Hatt couldn't see. But he did. He saw a whole lot of 1,000 franc notes, at least 10, maybe more, safe in the tureen. Well, everyone knows Albert's mother never had that much money all at one time. She had her little pension and Albert, well, he didn't give her any of his money because he liked to dress pretty smartly, like the cap. He had some of his clothes made for him in Nior, up the line. So where did all the money come from in the tureen? No one knows, because no one talks. I've written letters, you know, to the prefect. I've told him. But everyone just wants things to settle down. Albert's dead. Let's forget Albert. Not me. You... Who owns that car? It's a kind of taxi, ambulance. Does odd jobs all over. There's a man from a Lyon door getting out of it. Just slip over. Ask the driver where he's been. It's our turn to get ahead of him. Right. And it turned out that he'd taken old cadaver to fontenay le comte which was where Etienne No was going to spend the day. The fox coming down again as the sun disappears. Are you going back to Paris? Of course not. I'm going to finish what I came to do. It's always the same... They stick together. They're rich, friends with the magistrates. The villagers are afraid. They gossip a bit at night when they've had something to drink, but then regret it in the morning. <laughs> Good night, Louis. If you need me, I'll be at Les Trois Mules all evening. And anyway, don't go without... And remember, they'll butter you up so you'll start believing what they say. I won't. I promise. Ah! Oh. Chief Inspector. I'm sorry I wasn't back for lunch, madame. I was uh, busy. Doing what? Oh, very little. Though I, I was helped in several ways by a young friend of Albert Retailleau's named Louis. Oh, him. Well, charming, of course. But his father led a local strike over something and was kicked out of the manager's office. His supporters said he was right, of course. Yes. He wanted more money for workers with large families. The manager uh, said he couldn't help it if his workers bred on Saturday nights when they were drunk. Mm. I believe he used another word for drunk. It was a long time ago and we don't talk about it. 
Silence is a great cure for everything. You wish to keep silent now, madame? Or are you dying to speak? No. About what? Would you like to smoke your pipe? I really wouldn't mind. I'm merely saying that there's nothing that can't be ignored. Or that's how I was brought up anyway. If you'll excuse me for a minute, ladies, I, I'd like to take a walk around the stable yards, if, if you've no objection. I'll come with you. Oh. You'll catch cold. Geneviève. I'll wear my cape. Fog's getting thicker. Your room is, is the one directly above us, isn't it? He always came in that way. There's the ladder. It was always there and he just had to push it along. Your parents' room? Three along. Oh, I wonder. Then the spare room where Albon slept last night and an empty room in between. Your parents never suspected? No. How long had the affair been going on? Three and a half months. And he realised what was going to happen? He was going to tell my parents everything and marry me. Why was he angry that last evening? I said, why... I heard what you said. Well? I don't understand. Why do you say he was angry? Nothing out of the ordinary happened between you that night? No, nothing. What time did he leave? About half past twelve. He came about midnight. Did he usually stay for such a, a short time? Did you have a row? Why should we have a row? I don't know. When was he to speak to your parents? Soon. We were waiting for the right moment. And you heard no noise out here in the yard? I didn't see anything. I swear to you, Chief Inspector, I know nothing. I shall never, never tell my father what I said to you last night. I shall leave. I don't know what I'll do. Why did you tell me? I was frightened. I thought you'd find out everything and tell my parents. Let's go in. You won't say anything. Trust me. You'll start believing what they say. You're one of them. I'm sorry to have kept supper waiting. I had a busy day in Fontenay-le-Comte. I'm chairman of the local board of agriculture. Uh, where's my daughter? Uh, well, she was in the hall just now. Uh, I must apologise for not being back for lunch. So I believe. Not that it mattered in the least. Where's Almond? He's not here yet. He's a lonely man, really. Ever since his wife, uh, you know... Uh, We've made him very much a member of the family. Ah, Genevieve. Papa? Good to see you up and about. Can I get anyone an Armagnac? Oh, no, thank you. No. Well, I expect you've got nowhere, Chief Inspector. Uh, <laughs> certainly the mysterious cap has disappeared. You know about the cap. I never believed it existed. Though we don't actually talk about silly rumours here, do we? It's better that way. <laughs> Let's go in. Albon can join us later. Do forgive me, dear, dear ah. friends. I mm. didn't mean to keep you from the wonderful food I see before me. <laughs> Madame Genevieve, would you believe it, Chief Inspector, that after you left this morning, I came across this quite by chance? What is it? You've all made fun of my mania for hoarding the smallest scrap of paper. I can produce the tiniest laundry bill dating back four or five years. This, as you will see, Monsieur Maigret, is a hotel bill from the Hôtel de l'Europe in La Roche-Yon. Yeah. 30 francs dated January the 7th, <laughs> the very night of the... Uh, of course, it's not important, but I do remember how the police do like people to have alibis. Huh. Pardon? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Well... You're making quite sure you're in the clear before you're accused. What do you mean, Etienne? I came across this bill quite by chance when I was sorting out some papers. Mm -hmm. I'd have brought it up at lunchtime if the chief inspector had been here, because I thought it would interest him to see what a strange coincidence it was that it had the same date. So you said. I hope you don't think I'd abandon my friends when they were in hot water. We're not in hot water. What are you thinking about, Monsieur Maigret? Oh, I'm sorry, but my mind was wandering. Mm. 
So, <clears throat> what do you make of it now? Now that you've seen the neighbourhood and asked a few questions? He's met young Louis. I think Albert Retailleau was very unlucky. There's a statement worthy of the ancient oracles. I'd certainly be uneasy if I hadn't miraculously found proof that I was sleeping peacefully in a hotel room 80 kilometres from here at the time of the year. Uh... There's a saying in the police force that he who has the best alibi is the greatest suspect. <laughs> <laughs> Did you come back to Saint-Aubin the next day? Yes, a friend gave me a lift. And I came for dinner here. You go from friend to friend, in fact. Uh, would you like another glass of wine? Chief Inspector? Uh, would you be so kind as to tell me if you finished questioning me? If you have, I would like to go. I want to get home early tonight. Good. Excellent. I'd like to walk as far as the village so we can go together. I came by bicycle. It could be pushed. Someone had given something away. It was their determination not to talk that was giving them away. And in the fog that had thickened during the evening, things got clearer still. They are such good sorts, aren't they? Such a united family. But as you say, it must be rather dull for a young girl. Has she many friends? I don't know of any in the neighbourhood. She does stay with her cousins from time to time. Oh, and I think you said she goes to Paris to uh, Monsieur Bijon. She stayed with him this winter, in fact. And apart from La roche sur yon you yourself hardly ever leave Saint-Aubin. I have a cousin in Nantes. You ever get to Paris? A city of high culture? I was there a month ago. Same time as Mademoiselle No. Possibly, I really don't know. Well, here we are. You can find your way home, and we'll meet tomorrow at our mutual friends. I, uh, I hate to ask a favour, but I've been taken short. I do need rather desperate. Uh, yes, to, uh... well, come in then. Just for a moment. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you so much. Well, if it isn't my old friend Inspector Cadaver. What are you doing here, Justin Carver? I was just uh, reading a book. Reading a book? Oh, I see. What is it? Oh. Education of a Maiden. Well, there's great literature for you. Uh, you found this little book in the library of our friend Albin Groucotel? I certainly didn't bring it with me. Oh, perhaps Monsieur Groucotel bought it on one of his cultural visits to Paris, among the bookshops of the Faubourg Saint-Martin. Of course... Your wives, both of them. I have nothing both. to say, and I suggest Monsieur Grucotel ask you to leave. It's my house, and I won't be told what to do in it. I didn't ask you to come to the village of the first place, Carve. Who did? I have nothing to say. You taught me the value of silence years ago, Chief Inspector, and I would like a lawyer here if I'm to answer your questions. In the event of your being accused of stealing a cap, for instance. <laughs> Certainly. I came here to ask Mr. Grucatel some questions. I haven't met him until now. You heard about him at fontenay le Con this lunchtime, I suppose? Mm. His alibi for the night of the murder is perfect, by the way. Mm. Although, I think the obvious way he flourished it in the face of the No family wasn't appreciated. Especially by Genevieve, who treated him to some very savage looks. I wouldn't be surprised if she didn't revenge herself on him for that piece of blatant self-interest. Nonsense. Genevieve is a very charming girl who is... Three and a half months pregnant. What? I don't believe it. Don't tell me there's something I know that you don't carve. Perhaps you two have things to discuss alone, then, because I seem to know more than I thought. There was only one way to discover things in Saint-Aubin, and that was to listen to people when they didn't know you were there. Outside Albin's house, I stood close to the window, and as I did so, Louis pushed close to me. I saw you with the aristocrat. People say you're one of them. Far from it. I'm on the road to justice, Louis. Huh? Just listen. It's not my fault, is it? Not your fault. You didn't tell me she was pregnant. Well, why should I? Dreadful megrays, you have to find out everything, more than you know, and life is going to become impossible. I'm a poor man, Carl. I need rich friends. Who are you ringing? No, of course. To then get rid of this ridiculous chief inspector to ask his brother-in-law to call him back. We need peace here, Carl. It's all going wrong. Keep calm, monsieur. I can't. I'm ringing no now. 
And why did he ask the Maidre of all people to come and prove the murder was an accident when he'd already engaged you? He's a fool, not a fool. I mean, you were doing so well. He was nearly off the hook. Uh, hello? I'll do the talking. I'll do the talking. Let me go. go. Monsieur No, Carver. I wonder if you could arrange for your brother-in-law to call the Chief Inspector home. He's not doing what you wanted, and Mr. Gugatel is getting dangerously... Move away, away Louis. Things are coming into my head. Was Albert very angry the night he went to Genevieve's at last time? Very. He drank several brandies and said he probably wouldn't stay any longer in this godforsaken place. And, uh, and how long had he been Genevieve's lover? He started sleeping with her in October, just over three months ago. Three and a half months. And he was angry. Huh? He never mentioned her before October. <sighs> Mr. Maigret, what are you doing? Thinking. Except I, uh, I don't really think. You won't give up, will you? Go home, Louis. I promise you won't give up. I wish I could. Don't abandon us, monsieur. Uh, did you have an interesting time with Albon, Chief Inspector? Uh, yes, yes. The, um... The women are in bed, I assume. Yeah, Armagnac, to go with your pipe. Oh. Thank you. I'll be gone by tomorrow lunchtime. Hmm? Or earlier, if you like. Oh, but you must know that we enjoy your company a great deal. And we'd be happy to... I overheard the telephone call, Monsieur No. And by now you must want me gone as soon as possible. I'm finding out things and you didn't mean me to do that. You meant me not to find out things. I realized that quite soon and would have gone home this morning had it not been for Carver. His presence <laughs> goaded me into staying. You sent for him, I think. So I'm not here on official business. I am not accountable to anyone, so you have nothing to fear from me. Very well. I'll go on. Though I am practically certain you killed... Albert Retaillot. I am also practically certain that you are not primarily responsible for his death. You are, in a way, a victim of it. W what do you mean? Will you trust me to tell you what I think? <laughs> <laughs> Did you never suspect something was going on between your daughter and the young man? How could I? He wasn't part of our set. Oh, I recognized his face. I suppose I'd seen him in the village, but I... I couldn't put a name to him. I still wonder how Genevieve managed to meet him as she virtually never left the house. On the night in question, you and your wife went to bed as usual? We'd had goose for dinner. Well, I love goose, but I find it hard to digest, and about half past twelve I went along the corridor to the lavatory when I heard sounds of an argument coming from my daughter's room. Well, I suppose we're a bit behind the times in Saint-Aubin, but it never occurred to me that my daughter, my well-brought-up daughter, with... I was going to rush in, wearing only my nightshirt, but uh, some sort of protocol. I changed there in the bathroom, and as I gazed through the curtains, I saw a man climb out of Genevieve's window and onto a ladder. My first thought was he was a thief, 
I ran downstairs, took the key to the front door. It's huge. You must have seen it. And I rushed out to the front of the house and shouted for him to stop. Then... I can hardly bear to tell you. He, um, shouted such things at me. What a hypocritical family we were. What thieves. And above all, this was the thing that did it. What a filthy whore my Genevieve was. I hit him with the key as hard and as often as I could. And then I ran indoors and told my wife what I'd done. She washed your clothes and kept your secret? Yes, but first I went back to see if the young man was really dead. He was. I lifted him up and carried him to the level crossing where the road goes to the village. And that was the whole story. Finished. Not quite, I think. Hmm? You sent for Carl. Well, you see, I was alone. I was burning to talk to someone. I, I didn't want to keep burdening my wife. I didn't know what to say to my daughter, and uh, Alban suddenly stopped visiting me. I couldn't understand it, especially as the rumours began. Eventually, I, I went to him and told him everything. He recommended a private detective be found to... Well, to save my good name. And also, in a moment of panic, I called my brother-in-law, thinking he would assume I was innocent and, I don't know, give me advice. Instead, he sent you. In the meantime, you paid off the boy's mother? And will continue to do so, as long as she lives. I had to atone... I had to make up for... <laughs> Dear God. <laughs> but you also wanted to be safe. And so this morning, you met with Carver to find out how far he had bribed the people of the village to say nothing, and to burn the evidence of the blood-stained cap. Well, you are, in fact, safe. But we haven't quite reached the end. Please... Ring your friend, Albon, and insist that he comes out here at once. If I could get the whole thing settled then and there, I could catch the first train of the day, the 611, the one that had destroyed the body of Albert Etteo. I could go home. It only needed Alban to come out in a foggy night, though I knew he wouldn't have the guts to come by himself. Carvera was there to support him. Ineffectively, of course. Well, gentlemen, the game is up. What do you mean? You have nothing to fear, Alban? Perhaps. Monsieur No and I have had a long and friendly chat, and I am returning to Paris in the morning, as you all want me to, but I think it would be better if the truth came out before I left. What? I'm sorry, Carve, to have spoiled your night's rest. It wasn't me who sent to Paris for him. It wasn't you who beat Retaillot's head in. It wasn't you who left your wife. It's never you, is it? You've never done anything at all in your life. Oh, come, he, he's a gentleman. You're all gentlemen. And no one has complained about the boy's death because you're gentlemen. His mother has even settled for a life's income. And the strange thing is that the killer has no idea why the boy was killed, does he, Monsieur Cru Cotel? Are you going to tell him? You're under no obligation to say anything. Send Albor away. Hmm? Bring Albor, mother. Father, get rid of Albor. Etienne, come quickly. Jesus. I'm coming. Excuse me, gentlemen. Well, Albon? She started it. And anyway, I'm not the first middle-aged aristocrat to have taken a young girl as his mistress. 
She's quite lucky. And I suppose she sent you the dirty books and dirty pictures to ease the way for your Parisian meetings. I warn you, the chief inspector is setting a trap. And when she got pregnant by you, I suppose it was her idea to involve some local lad, blame him, marry herself off to him, and have you as a permanent lover disguised as a family friend. As a matter of fact... Oh, no. The whole idea was yours. You impregnated Genevieve No quite deliberately, so she would have to marry Albert and provide you with a life of secret pleasure. When he found out what trick was being played on him, he grew, I'm told, extremely angry. Arrogant puppy. If the stupid postmistress hadn't muddled our letters, everything would have gone perfectly. Instead of which, when you knew you'd been found out and there would be a row, you faded away as usual and got yourself an alibi. You're vile, Alban. Vile beyond belief. Why? I've done nothing illegal. But enormously immoral. Oh. Steady, Mr. Chief! If there were true justice in the world, it would place the blame for all of this fully on your oh. shoulders. Our bon cartel. You sponging, self-deluding, petty, aristocratic bloodsucker. I'd happily lead you to the guillotine. She's calmer now. I don't quite know what it is she has against you, Albon. He'll tell you himself when he's recovered. He's going to get a divorce soon, though he hasn't told anyone about it. No. I'm dead on my feet. The 611, I think. I'll catch that too. Don't be too hard on your daughter, Etienne. Is everyone deserting me? It was cold and foggy to the last outside the comfy house. There were only two of us on that early morning platform. What do you think will happen? They'll sell up and leave the country. The baby will be a scandal they can't hide. So it ended in a dream world. You didn't see Louis again? No. Nothing would have been gained trying to expose the truth in a law court. But I suppose he'll always think that I finally became one of them. Perhaps he was right. Poor Louis. A victim like his friend. Decent People do such awful things to keep their place. Georges Simenon's Maigret, Inspector Cadaver, translated by Helen Thompson, was dramatised by David Cregan. Nicholas Leprevo was Chief Inspector Maigret, and Julian Barnes was Simenon. Monsieur No was played by Michael N. Harbour, Madame No by Karen Archer, and Jean Vieve by Alice Hart. Alban was played by John Rowe, Louis by Scott Brooksbank, Magistrate Brejean by Philip Fox, Madame Retello, Joanna McCallum, and Inspector Cavre, Inspector Cadaver, by David Bannerman. The music was composed and directed by Lucinda Mason Brown and performed by the Viper's Dream Quartet. The director was Ned Chaillet, was Ned Chaillet, was Ned Chaillet.